first of all, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing really well, thank you. I was very fortunate to see Tetris uh, quite a couple of days ago, actually, and I have to say you made one hell of an entertaining film, first and foremost. Oh, thank you, appreciate you saying. Never would have thought in my wildest dreams that the drama behind the making of Tetris was that <laughs> dramatic, to say the least. Yeah, me neither, right? me neither. So in talking about the story of Tetris, I actually want to go even further back than when you got the screenplay to when you came on board. I want to know, what was your first experience with playing the game Tetris? No, I wasn't very good, I have to be honest. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I'm not a natural gamer. Um, the games I sort of tend to go towards are more like the FIFA soccer sort of games, the sport games. So, so Tetris, when it first came out, or when I was first aware of it, I, you know, I liked it, but I wasn't particularly good at it. I'm a lot better now because I've practiced so much just in case, you know, Hank or Alexi ever challenged me to a game that at least I would you know, obviously not be able to beat them, but at least I wouldn't embarrass myself so much, you know. So, so not very good at the beginning, but way better now. That's fair. That's totally fair. And so jumping ahead now to coming on board with the project, understanding the history behind the game, how was the script initially pitched to you? Because when I hear myself, oh, this is about the making of a video game, it doesn't sound like the most exciting story, but yet, yeah. but yet. <laughs> yeah, so um, the script actually was originally called Falling Blocks, yeah? Uh, B-L-O-C-X, B-L-O-C-S. Um, and I thought it was a really clever title because obviously hinted at, you know, Falling blocks as in Tetris, but also the, the the dissolvement of the of the Soviet Union as well. So I knew even just by the title that the content of, of it was going to be sort of Cold War thriller as well as something, you know, not just about this particular video game. So it hit my interest on on many levels. And then when I read the story and realized how bizarre a story it was, um, then I thought, well, I had no idea about this at all. And I'm sure most people out there will have absolutely no idea, unless you're a massive Tetris fan and you, you've you looked up the sort of whole history behind it. But I think your average person in the street will not have a clue about this. And I thought, if I can create a movie that makes people feel how I felt when I first read the script, then I'm interested, yeah? And that, so it was a challenge as well, you know, because it's quite a, it's quite a complicated story and it's, you know, it's... It's set across this, this uh, you know, four or five different countries. And so it was a big challenge to do and a, and a far bigger budget than I've ever done before, far more visual effects. And it, it's on a totally different level of, of filmmaking to what I've ever done before. Um, so that was something that, that pulled me in. And obviously having the ability to work with Taryn and Matthew and these guys, uh, again, was something that I, you know, could help raise my game to and, 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 and try and sort of challenge myself. So... So, yeah, it was kind of like a no-brainer, but especially when I read that title, Falling Blocks, I thought, oh, this is really clever, yeah? Really yeah. clever, it got me in. But it was a great script. No script was really great. I mean, it needed a tiny bit of work, but all scripts do. But So starting point, we were, we're, in a real, we're in a real good place. You mentioned a couple of different things there I want to touch upon, one being uh, working on a period film, which you're no stranger to, your last film being Stan and Ollie. But tell me this, what is the one element of designing a period film from the ground up that you think most filmmakers underestimate when they embark on such a project? Uh, the, I think it's, for me, it's always how much it costs to clothe, feed, and transport the background artists. Yeah? Mm. That's the big thing. And that's where you, as a filmmaker, you, you, you have to fight and protect, I worked with Danny Boyle once and he used to always say, make sure you've got enough background, right? You know, people underestimate the background, right? And, and, they, and they dress two or three people in a particular way that, okay, they're very iconic 80s. And he said, you'd rather get 20 people and kind of dress them like the 80s, but because but, everybody didn't look like Cindy Lauper in the 80s, right? Okay, you know, so so the point being that is is get resource, you know, keep back some resources to, to make sure you've got enough. I mean, obviously now, in the age of visual effects, you can you can multiply crowds and stuff. But when you're looking for a, like a, a street scene when there's 20 or 30 people, it makes such a difference than when you're just using five. So it's like, be smart with the money. 
um, and, and and be smart where you're spending your money, but particularly background when it comes to um, period, because that's the kind of thing that your movie can live or die on. Sure, sure. And in talking about visual effects, were the animated sequences, some of the visual effects work, the way that you incorporate the kind of old style of uh, that visual look of a video game. Yeah. And was that in the screenplay or is that something you all came up with later on? And how did you that, incorporate that? Yeah, that wasn't really, the, the, I mean, Noah hinted it, hinted to it in the screenplay where it was like player one, player two, next level, game over, these kind of things, like chapter, almost like chapters, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I, I wasn't a really, con when I was shooting the movie, I wasn't really concentrating. I was concentrating on more like the thriller aspect. What is the narrative going to be and getting that done because you have, you've got 10 weeks of shoot. You, you, you can't concentrate on, on, on that, th those chapter stuff until you get your movie together. So I would do that. And then it was only when we came into post that was more driven by, especially Matthew Vaughn, who was our producer, who, who was, who a lot of that was his idea um to push those push those things and and I think it was an organic process where we we tried little elements and, and some of the characters would come to life and then it was like oh well we maybe should do some of the exteriors like that right exterior of Hink's uh, apartment because we couldn't get to Tokyo to, to shoot that and we we're using archive and it was like okay so so one idea led to another and another and I think at one stage we probably got a little bit too excited and put too much in um, and then we said, right, no, that's too much. We took out, and then we took too much out, and then we put, you know, enough back in to. So, so it was just we were sort of tuning the radio of really finely, old still. So I sound so old. I thought old analog radios, you know, tuning them in slow, so finely, to to balance up the tone of the movie. <clears throat> but yeah, a lot of the that eight bit graphic stuff was 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 more was coming was being driven from Matthew and and the visual effects guys, yeah. I like it because it gives the film a very unique sort yeah. of tone, like you were saying. Yeah. Helps it stand out a lot. Um, it does. And, it feels unique. For, yeah, because of that. Yeah. And speaking of standing out too, Taron Egerton, I feel like is uh, really showing us constantly with each passing film role such tremendous range. No character yeah. he plays seems to be the same as the last one. And yeah. I want to know what qualities in him as an actor you felt were right for this role because this is a very difficult role to pull off and one that he's never done before. Yeah. I agree. I think one. I think the first thing is 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 I feel is it's probably his best performance to date because he is, he show, he's shown another side of what he can do, uh, and a more grounded performance. What makes him so good is he's he's an incredibly intelligent guy, very articulate, very intelligent, and I've always found that those people may make the best actors, right? Cleverest people, make make the best actors, right? Those who can act. Um, and so, and and when you get someone smart, they challenge you as a director, and then it makes you better as a director because you have to come up with the answers. You have to say, well, why are we doing it this way? And then you have to justify that and and go through the thing. So, so he as an actor makes you raise your game as well. Um, and but yeah, I was very impressed with his his work ethic and his professionalism. I have to say, uh, and ultimately the the, the end result. Uh, Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. I think he's he's shown again something different. Well, now that you've uh, finished completing work on Tetris, it's world premiere at South by Southwest. Uh, what is next for you? What is on the horizon? Uh, any? Can you tell us about any future projects you have coming up? Yeah, I'm going to Canada to to do a movie on Saturday. I fly to Canada to do a movie, uh, and it's with two of my favorite actors. Oh. The whole time. Wow. Uh, and I've just been told I cannot say what it is, which is really frustrating. But I'm sure it will be announced very soon. Uh, but it's a movie in the vein of kind of Little Miss Sunshine. It's that kind of, it's that sort of tone, right? But two of the best, in my opinion. Um, so I'm extremely excited about that. And as soon as I can tell you, I will absolutely tell you. Very exciting. Congratulations on the film once again. And thank you so much for the time here. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dave.